Hi, one question that I often get is if a simple viscoelastic material model can predict permanent set. And most people seem to think so, that if you have springs and dashboards arranged like this, like in a viscoelastic material model, how could you possibly predict a permanent set using a certain material model? And the argument here is the spring is somehow bringing the deformation back to zero if you wait long enough, if you take away the load on, on the system. So that's kind of the, the problem a lot of people fall into, because that's not true. You can indeed predict permanent set using a viscoelastic material model. And uh, you should not get thought stop, stuck in the thought of the spring here driving the deformation back to zero. That's not always the case. The key to remember is this dashpot down here, if you want to call it dashpot. This rheological representation is really simplistic. When it comes to these material models, there are a little bit more to them than this spring dashpot uh, picture. So uh, don't get stuck on the idea uh, that the spring here would bring it all back. It all depends on the nature of that dashpot itself, the equations that drive the response in that case. So here's an example. This is the Bergstrom Boyce model, which is a model I developed some time ago. And this is the poly U mod version of it. And some of the equations that describe the, the viscoelastic flow of this dashpot. Uh, here it is. So this looks like a pretty complicated equation, but it's relatively simple. So the left-hand side is just the magnitude of viscoelastic flow. And gamma dot zero is a dimensional constant. The next part of the equation here is just a strain dependence of the viscoelastic flow, showing how the viscoelastic flow changes depending on the strain magnitude. The next part is the stress. So basically, it's stress raised to a power m, and m is some kind of number typically between 4 and 10 or so. Um, but the key here is the equation is a little bit more complicated than that. So r here is another function. This is the ramp function. This says that when the argument of the ramp function is 0 or below 0, negative that is, the argument, the result is 0. And then it's the same as the argument when the, when the value is uh, above 0. So it becomes equal to 0 once this is above 0. And if this is less than 0, then it becomes 0. And, and that's useful here because, as you can see, there's a tau cut variable here saying that when the shear stress divided by some uh, flow resistance is less than some critical value, this will be negative, and then the ramp function will be zero, and therefore the deformation rate, the viscoelastic deformation rate, will be zero too. So even though most of these uh, viscoelastic material models, in some sense, are uh, flow equations that don't have a yield surface, so don't have like some plasticity where you have a traditional yield surface. These models don't have a traditional yield surface, but they can have a cutoff value, like I show here. So if the, the driving stress is below this, you won't have any flow at all. In addition to that, even if you don't have this cutoff value here, when you raise this to a power m, if m becomes very large, what happens is this becomes more and more like a material model that has a yield surface. So the m value has a strong influence on the permanent set. The tau cat has a strong value on the permanent set that's predicted by this kind of model. So let's take a look at this by using m calibration. So here is a, uh, a window of M calibration. In order to set it up to save a little bit of time, I have the poly U mod Bergstrom Boyce model here. This is a Yo hyperelastic model that has some flow equations here that we talked about on the previous slide. Tau cut is this value, M is eight in this case. And then I have some virtual test cases. The first virtual test case is a case where I, I load my virtual specimen to 30% strain with this strain rate. Then I unload it with a negative strain rate to get unloading until the stress becomes zero. And then finally, I'm holding the stress rate zero. So basically holding stress at this unloaded configuration for a certain amount of time. This is one hour in this case. And uh, if I run this one, um, you see that this is now the Bergson voice model with these parameters. It's loading up and then unloading it. And then it starts to recover here you zoom in here, you can see that the strain comes back slowly with time, just like you would expect in a real polymer. If you plot strain versus time, we'll see that the strain recovers a lot initially, and then it kind of goes like this. So this is after one hour. 
Will this go back all the way to zero strain if you waited even longer? Well, it's a little hard to say here, right? But just looking at this figure, I created another load case here where I hold it for 100 hours instead of one hour. So this is, I do this virtual experiment, I hold it for 100 hours at zero strain. And if I run both of these, you will see now, this is the result in blue here is the one that dominates. This is a very long time, 100 hours of zero load on it. And it's certainly not coming back very much. We have a pretty substantial uh, residual strain going on here. And uh, that's pretty typical. You can, you can target the, the type of relax recovery response you get using the parameters here. So if you had real experimental data, you could find these parameters to match the, the permanent set that you measured in your experiments. And that's kind of the whole point with this model. Also keep in mind that real polymers uh, don't really have a permanent set that's easy to define because if you take a polymer and you do a test and then you measure the residual strain right after the test, then you typically get a different value than if you had waited an hour or a week and then you go back and measure it again. Polymers tend to recover slightly over time, and that's why the concept of residual strain is not perhaps the best. So to summarize, permanent set is difficult to use. Residual strain is better. So that's what I should have said. Um, a nonlinear viscoelastic material can often predict the amount of strain you see after the load is applied. So it's a useful tool, even though it may look like this kind of real representation. And there are cases where it's even better if you add a little bit of plasticity to the equilibrium network in order to have a little bit more freedom to, to predict that kind of response. But that's not always the case, but sometimes that's useful. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.